Right now around the world, children have been left to fend for themselves. Sometimes the parents have been lost in some tragedy, and sometimes the parents are the tragedy. This week on Bad Things in History, we're talking about feral children, and I personally guarantee that you will learn something new by the end of this video. Something fascinating. For the past several thousand years, philosophers, kings, and most recently scientists have wondered what makes humans different from the other animals. Many of them concluded that language is what defines humanity's place in the natural world. Others suggested perhaps the calming nature of civilization is a primary factor. Almost every answer to the question of what makes humans special appears incomplete when taking feral children into account. These outliers of civilization are usually left to fend for themselves during early childhood. The details of their stories vary widely. The end result, nearly always, is a child that behaves more like an animal than a civilized person. Feral children are living philosophical problems where the question of what it means to be human is concerned. If someone is genetically human in every way, but is incapable of acquiring language, then is that person still what we would consider human? If a child is unable to walk on two legs and only speaks in grunts, is that child still a human? What exactly are the requirements to be a member of the human race after all? Is it simply a matter of genetics, or is learned behavior equally important? In the 5th century BC, Herodotus wrote of an Egyptian pharaoh that wanted to learn the origin of language. So, to do this, he created a rather misguided experiment. The pharaoh took two newborn babies and gave them to a shepherd and told the shepherd to care for them. But the shepherd was not to speak to the children, nor was he ever to allow anyone else to speak to the children. He was instructed to listen for the first words that came out of their mouths. The pharaoh thought this would then help determine the root of all human language. The first sound one of the children uttered, that sounded like it could be a word, was bekos. It sounded a lot like the sound of sheep bleating. The shepherd, though, thought it sounded like the Phrygian word for bread. So he told the pharaoh, and the pharaoh was convinced all human language must have arisen in what is modern-day Turkey. This tale may have never happened, because Herodotus was known to record legend and fact almost equally. And the pharaoh's conclusion was not correct. But the shepherd's story does illustrate how easy it can be to completely misinterpret human behavior. Misunderstandings often arise between two people who speak a common language. How difficult it must be, then, to determine the reasons why feral children behave as they do. Documentation about these neglected offspring that is actually reliable began to appear in the 1700s. One well-known case from that period is Victor of Aveyron. Victor's exact birth date isn't known, but those who studied him thought it must have been around 1788. He was apparently born a normal, healthy baby boy. His parents, though, were alcoholics and Victor was neglected. At some point in his early childhood, he left civilization entirely and lived in the wild, fending for himself. Nobody ever figured out exactly how he came to live in the forest. He was first spotted by those living in the surrounding area in 1794. In 1797, three hunters saw him. Victor ran from them and climbed up a tree, but they were able to catch him. The hunters took Victor to a nearby town, and he was given to a widow who tried to care for him. But Victor was not very interested in the arrangement and returned to the forest. Victor was spotted in 1798 and 1799, but nobody tried to recapture him. Finally, in January of 1800, Victor emerged from the woods on his own and entered the town. Jean-Marc Gaspard Itard, a young medical student, brought Victor into his home and cared for him, and also studied him in the process. Itard believed there were two main things that separated humans from animals, empathy and language. He intended to demonstrate the theory was true by civilizing Victor. Early results seemed promising, as Victor quickly understood simple words. 
but he was never able to progress beyond very rudimentary language skills. He did, surprisingly, show empathy. One night, Itard's housekeeper was sitting at a table crying over the recent loss of her husband. Victor actually stopped what he was doing and tried to console her. So, even though he didn't understand complex language, emotionally Victor appeared to understand other people's emotional states just fine. Etard's conclusion was that Victor was functionally deaf and dumb. Modern psychiatrists that have reviewed the case have a more nuanced opinion, though. They think that Victor may have been born normal, then developed a condition such as autism or perhaps infantile psychosis. The fact Victor chose to live in the forest for years when he had the option to live with people is what makes them think an illness may be responsible. For the remainder of his life, after returning to civilization, Victor was cared for. He eventually died of pneumonia in 1828 in the home of the housekeeper he consoled years earlier. The study of other feral children throughout the years helped to determine that many of them could recover more fully than Victor. It also demonstrated that there appears to be a special developmental period during which language is acquired. And if a child isn't exposed to language during that period, it is very difficult to learn later in life. This is believed to be proof for what is known as the critical period hypothesis. It is important to point out that there is no single accepted definition for language. So, proving the hypothesis definitively true has not been possible yet. Still, the stories of feral children demonstrate that early childhood is an important time in shaping human behavior. Ivan Mishikov ran from his alcoholic mother and her abusive boyfriend when he was four. He survived by living with wild dogs. Ivan earned their trust by giving them food, and in turn the dogs protected him. This arrangement lasted for two years. Police eventually captured Ivan by setting a trap. They left food in a restaurant kitchen. Then, when Ivan and the dogs came to eat it, they managed to grab the child. This didn't happen hundreds of years ago, either. Ivan was a feral child captured in 1998. Ivan was one of the ideal cases where his recovery was concerned. He learned language without much difficulty. Ivan even studied military history and served in the Russian army. Sometimes the conditions experienced by these children are so harsh that they can never live a normal life again. Feral children deprived of all human contact and mental stimulation for their entire childhood live in a world that few can ever imagine. A situation that would cause abject terror for most of us is just a normal day for these poor souls. Jeannie, who was discovered in 1970, is perhaps the most shocking example in recent history. Her real name is not known as researchers continue to protect her identity. Jeannie's father was not exactly the ideal parent. He hated children because they were too noisy and did not want any of his own. And Jeannie was only the last in a long line of unfortunate infants to be born into the family. Five years into marriage, Jeannie's mother became pregnant with her first child. She was legally blind and could not take care of herself or her children without help. Her husband beat her for the entire pregnancy, and even tried to strangle her near the end of it. Still, a healthy baby girl was born. But the poor girl's father couldn't stand the sound of her cries and put her in the garage. The baby caught pneumonia and died at 10 weeks old. A boy was born a year later to the couple. He died at two days of age, either due to a blood issue or choking on his own mucus. The cause wasn't entirely clear. Three years after this, they had another son. He was healthy, but the father insisted that the mother had to keep him quiet. This treatment caused a number of developmental delays. Five years later, in 1957, Jeannie was born. Around this time, her father's mental state was even more paranoid, and he began to isolate his family from everyone. Jeannie had an examination at three months of age, and it was found she was born with a dislocated hip. 
Because of this, Jeannie had to wear a very restrictive splint from the age of 4 months to 11 months. This led Jeannie's father to believe that Jeannie must be mentally deficient. He refused to talk to her and he insisted that Jeannie's mother and brother also not talk to her. Six months after the hip diagnosis, Jeannie's grandmother died. She was run over by a vehicle while walking with Jeannie's brother. Jeannie's father became even more insistent that he had to protect his family. And he did this for Jeannie by hiding her existence from everyone. He quit his job and moved the family into his mother's house where he could keep watch over them every moment of each day. If Jeannie tried to make any noise or speak, her father beat her with a wooden plank. For reasons not quite understood, if he became angry at Jeannie, he would bare his teeth and growl like a dog. And he also grew out his fingernails so that he could scratch her as punishment. In addition to the abuse, Jeannie's father fed her as little as possible. When he did allow her to eat, he didn't let her have solid food. Most of the time, she had to eat baby food. Amazingly, we know most of these details because Jeannie's father kept detailed records about the mistreatment of his family. Jeannie's mother, despite this, would find ways to give Jeannie more food. She argued with her husband, at times trying to get help for Jeannie, but her husband was convinced that Jeannie would be dead by 12 years old. He agreed that if Jeannie was still alive after that, then he would consider allowing Jeannie's mother to seek help. When Jeannie reached 12 years of age, her father did not keep up his end of the bargain. Jeannie's mother waited another year, then finally tried to find help for her daughter. In October 1970, Jeannie's mother finally left her husband. She moved with Jeannie to her mother's house. A few weeks later, Jeannie's mother went to apply for disability benefits. Being blind, she couldn't see that well and accidentally entered the social services office next door to where she was supposed to go. Once Jeannie's mother was questioned and they realized Jeannie's age and the state of her development, the authorities arrested Jeannie's mother and father. Jeannie was made ward of the state and taken to the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. The case received a lot of media attention. Jeannie's father could not handle the pressure and took his own life with a gun two months later. The researchers that studied Jeannie were amazed and horrified by what they found. Jeannie's motor skills were almost non-existent. She could not stand up straight, nor fully straighten her arms or legs. At almost 14 years of age, Jeannie was only 4 feet 6 inches tall and weighed 59 pounds. Even though her eyes seemed normal on examination, she couldn't focus on anything more than 10 feet away, which was the length of the room in which she was kept her entire life. Several researchers worked with Jeannie over the next several years. Jeannie did pick up language to some degree. Her social behaviors were never completely appropriate, and she did not manage to overcome all of her developmental handicaps. During the years of research, very little valid scientific data came from it. Nobody managed to answer deep questions about human development by studying Jeannie. Also, after various court proceedings, it was decided that Jeannie's mother was not at fault. Jeannie's mother was eventually given guardianship again. In 1978, she refused to allow researchers access to Jeannie anymore. Jeannie is still alive, but lives out of the public eye and is safely anonymous. A private investigator several years ago supposedly determined that she was living in a facility for the mentally handicapped and had been there since her mother died in 2003. By your definition, are feral children who cannot master language or follow social behavioral norms actually human? Whether or not they can master language, and whether or not they can behave appropriately, these unlucky individuals still share the same range of emotions as the rest of us. 
Very few people in the modern world would try to argue that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are not part of our species or our society. In that context, then, there is no question that they are indeed human. But could you ever build a society of feral children? Most evidence would suggest that no, this could not happen. So it would appear that there is something more than just genetics and behavior that defines what it means to be human. Science has yet to unravel the meaning of it all. One thing we can say for certain is that depriving and abusing children is not a path to a better future. What are your thoughts on feral children? Would you welcome one into your home? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching Bad Things in History.